Hi, it's Stefan Nemmer here from Amsterdam, which is in Holland, which is a long way from the US. And I'm so happy to do this one um, in close collaboration with my dear friend and colleague Fiona Bloom of the Bloom Agency. And um, let's go straight into what I feel I should tell you about stuff I like, I dislike. And let me, you know, let me invite you to, to have a quick listen to what I'm at over here all the way back in Europe. So one of the biggest highlights of my career would have probably been quite a few years ago already. I was fortunate to be thrown in in front of the Lions, meaning in this case the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London, where they were supposed to play a piece of mine Whereas I'm not classically trained and the um, seriousness of this recording session in London really intimidated me, <laughs> I must say. I mean, I was bluffing, uh, but you know, I haven't got those kind of chops, but I did like the whole idea of writing for it. So um, I came in there with my, um, with my computer stuff and it, the scores were there on paper, written out by an, uh, another colleague from London, who's a guy called David Bedford. And, um, you know, he was the orchestrator for Tubular Bells, which was an album by an English guy called Mike Oldfield at the time. And this guy who helped me out was also responsible for that. Later, you heard his music in The Exorcist, the feature film, remember? So the orchestra was there waiting for me to give the signals. And I did, and it worked out fine. And I was amazed because they saw the music and they played it for the first time and it was dead on with my computer stuff. It was in perfect sync. And what I admired of this high level orchestra was that they couldn't only perform it at once. In Latin it's called Prima Vista, but they could also add expression to it and emotion I was highly impressed with the whole professionalism of it all and the artistry. So that was one of the biggest highlights ever in my musical career, next to working with producers like Tony Visconti, vocalists like Shaka Khan on the recent album on Homeground, uh, Perry Austin, who is like a, the Rolls Royce of vocal interpretation, such a sophisticated um, musician. Um, you know, so I'm really humbled and honored by working with uh, people I admire, people who I think are really, really good. And imagine that it's me coming from an improvisational electro noise group called the Mini Pops in the early 80s in Amsterdam, uh, going on this kind of boyhood adventure musically. I love it. I really do. So, the new artists that I'm kind of feeling these days are, well, I wouldn't call them new, but I think they are of influence. One of them is called Kendrick Lamar, and I guess most people will, you know, mention him as being kind of new in the way that he gives direction um, to um, the future of that style, if you could call it style. I love. Kamasi Washington for the same reason in jazz. Uh, it's been a long time since, um, you know, I got a little penchant for orchestral additions to either pop, jazz, rock, soul, hip hop. So um, I think Kendrick is doing that in his field. Kamasi is doing it in his field. And the third person I really, really dig is a guy not from far away from here, from Amsterdam. He lives in Berlin, but he comes from Iceland, and his name is Johan Johansson, wonderful name, uh, and not an artist name, it's his real name. And he's a nice guy, but most of all, he's a very, very adventurous new film composer, to the extent that he even, you know, could allow himself to say no to Blade Runner, because he didn't feel it. But... He's very adventurous and he brings a total new type of orchestration to 
the good old Hollywood classical type of soundtracking. So those three guys, Kendrick, Kamazi and Johan Johansson, I really am into these days. I can tell you about a person who I'm also into, which isn't a new name at all because he lived in the two centuries ago. It's a guy called, he's from Barcelona, you know, no pun intended, or no trouble intended, but his name is Federico Mompou, Federico Mompou, and he's a classical piano player and composer um, who lived early uh, 1900s and worked in Paris, worked in Barcelona, and when you hear his stuff, go check it out wherever you can, Federico Mompou, his name is, it's a modest sound, it's piano only, but the stuff he does is, I guess, more neo-minimalist than most contemporary composers are actually doing. He's a true find. So what I love doing, as you now can imagine, is virtual, meaning digital online crate digging. And not only in one style or genre, but many of them. So, I'm into those sounds at the moment. And if I could have dinner with uh, a person today, it would probably with, be with Kamasi, Washington. I met him at the North Sea Jazz Festival over here in Holland, in Rotterdam. A modest guy, but I noticed he was wearing all these, I wear two rings, but he wears like four or five rings. So. I thought out of politeness we should shake hands when we were introduced to each other. So I did that, but when I shook hands, and I'm not particularly forceful, but I, I you know, I shook hands and he, uh, and he was very polite, gave me a hand back, didn't use much force from his side. So what I heard was a little crunching of those rings when I, you know, shook his hand. So I apologized for that. And uh, the way he took that uh, just showed his persona in, in, in one moment. He's, he was very polite, very genteel, saying, don't worry, don't worry. And he listened um, carefully to what I had to say. You know, listening is a bit of an art as well. And, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that when people do, I do my best to listen to people without interrupting, for example. It doesn't work. Each day I interrupt. But um, that was great uh, meeting him, but it was so short that I'm sure um, his life view is so interesting that I think we could easily eat uh, four courses of a meal and still not be ready with the conversation. So that would be probably be Kamasi. Um, now, if I could go back in time, though, um, I would like to have a conversation with this guy I just mentioned, Federico Mompou from Barcelona. He appeared to be a very shy guy, almost like Kamasi. But um, in those days, um, it, you had to perform your music in front of a lot of people. Uh, there were no recording sessions, right? Um, early 1900s, he had to do the actual live gigs. And now, the reason why he didn't break through that much at the time was because he was afraid to do that. He was very, you know, he was very introvert. And uh, I guess I like that kind of people. So that'd be the one in the past who I'd like to talk to next to Einstein or someone. Um, and now when we come to something uh, in the negative, who or what pissed me off recently? Well, that isn't one circumstance or, or, or example or incident. It's more the whole thing that pisses me off recently is, uh, increasingly so, is the polarization overall, meaning the left and the right, the extreme and the other side extreme, uh, gender, race, religion, uh, more and more division. And I'm totally against that. But the way, the, fanat the fanatical uh, side from each tribe in this neo-tribalism neo uh, climate of today, I really disapprove of and I really dislike. 
I think there are far better ways of getting on together. Um, and if not out of friendliness, at least it should be done because of, you know, we have some other bigger problems almost, if I may say so, you know, like the planet. Uh, I don't want to be Al Gore. I, I, I don't want to be Trump. I don't want to be anyone. But um, the the either or thing is getting really boring. The or or stuff. Why not and and? Well, you can see I can uh, at least need a four course meal to to elaborate on this. But you get the meaning. You know that's that's what pisses me off. That it seems to get diversified even further than where the Woodstock generation rebelled against. It's even worse to rebel against today than it did at the time already. I mean, that was obvious. There was Nixon, there was Vietnam, but now there are a hundred Nixons and a hundred Vietnams. It's really complicated, but you know, we could just at least give it a try to, to do something about it. Now, something more hopeful would be for me to you know to fantasize about who i love to collaborate with and um it would sound funny because um everybody probably has a very strong opinion on the person i'd like to collaborate with and again see the previous question which i've answered um again there are a lot of people against or for him, it's a him, it's a he, because of his controversial nature and his controversial music. So I guess I would like to collaborate, but on equal terms, bear in mind, with Kanye West. I think what he uh, can bring in unorthodox uh, ways of approaching music I can complement or counter with some of the very, very best of non-conformist type of conceptual orchestral ideas about his music. So meaning not a three second sample of an older record, but actually create new stuff that only that doesn't imitate the past you know like um do the shaft thing but then slightly different no not at all just use the characteristics of something which was a classic thing in the past and then get to work with creating a fresh new idea on that basis and then hand it over to the big man and then see what you could do with it that would be you know one way of working with him um so that's that one yeah what inspires me is, you You probably think I'm pretentious with mentioning all the way from posh Europe again, another European composer. Well, his name was, I'm going to mention him anyway, Olivier Messiaen. And what he did was, he took time out for a year in Paris where he lived at the time. And he went to the park every day and he listened to the birds. And then what he did was he wrote, he wrote down the way they were singing, and then he transcribed that into his own music. Uh, I guess what I'm meaning to say is inspiration could come from anywhere. Usually where I get most inspiration is in the shower, not by singing very badly, like, you know, the cliche wants you to, uh, to know. Um, well, I do sing badly, but not under the shower. But under the shower, usually there's more oxygen you know, I'm more like a language guy. I don't know uh, a lot about, you know, um, uh, science. But however, I feel there's always more oxygen in the air whilst taking a shower. And when I do, I usually get my flesh ideas right there. Now, I can't take my smartphone over there because, you know, it isn't waterproof. So what I usually do is I take... Uh, like 10 seconds out of those shower sessions to do my musical memo thing and then return to finish off the showering. So that's where I can get my inspiration from. But I remember I was walking with an older guy in, um, in a park one day and uh, the way he did his dog whistling, you know, because we were walking a dog, his dog, 
and he did a thing which I thought that was a remarkable whistle and I'll do it for you. He, um, the dog was gone somewhere and uh, um, he wanted to return to us whilst we were walking in the park and um, he did his quick whistle um, and I thought that's an odd melody for for dog whistling you know but the dog came back in in, in seconds um, and I thought um, yeah it works for the dog but it could also work for the human ear right so I took the liberty after after asking him I said where do you get it from that that melody I don't know it just happened and I said well you know could I would you mind me using it in a, in a, in a music piece no no of course you should and um, you know that's how um, that was a piece of inspiration I got from uh, walking the dog so there's the shower there's the dog but there's one other way you can get inspiration which is not romantic at all it is the following you start playing the piano <laughs> A song called Yesterday or Yesterday I did on the Home Ground album uh, where the vocalist is the wonderful Frank McComb. Check it out, it's on Home Ground. The words or quotes I live by, I've really got one sort of general theme is that, uh, I mean it sounds kind of corny I guess, but go with the flow. I mean I used to resist so much against the flow, you know, especially when the flow is negative. You got to go there somewhere. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I suddenly started to think, but that's not the flow. It's just a question of how to recognize what is a flow. And when you recognize it, um, if it does you well or it doesn't, just follow it and you'll see there'll be a little surprise there, usually to your advantage or your benefit or your learning process. So in Latin, that's called panta rei. Panta Rey, almost like Lana del Rey, but it's called Panta Rey in Latin, meaning everything flows, which is what I go along with. Funnily enough, um, you know, I've been, an, uh, I'm making a little mental jump here to the next subject, which is, um, suppose I would do music for an ad campaign. Now, if an ad campaign uh, would be thrown at me for me to give some musical advice. Um, I guess the most extreme advice I would give would be to tell them as a musician, composer, don't use music, you know, because your neighbors in the advertising block burst, they all use music. So if you want to distinguish yourself, grow silent, like silent disco or something, you know, so that would be my advice uh, these days. Because there is in a way over usage of music in the elevator, on the TV screen, in the restaurant, um, on the smartphone, in bed, uh, on the internet. I liked the internet a bit more, you know, when um, it was silent, like in the Charlie Chaplin days, movies were. Silent movies, silent internet. Because I feel now when you sort of, you know, when you do your swiping through Facebook or Instagram, all those pop-up windows where there is um, audiovisual footage in being triggered by the swipe, you get all of a sudden something like Dire Straits coming along, which I'm not waiting for. I mean, I hate that. Both, you know, the swiping with noise being non-permissive and I'm not a big fan of the band. For an ad campaign, now I would like to challenge an advertiser for me to make music to. And the challenge would be going out to Apple. I'm an avid Apple user like many, many people who make music ever since the 80s. Um, unfortunately, I never liked the musical soundtracks to their ad campaignings like, well, we don't have to mention names, uh, they're all colleagues. Um, but um, 
I thought it was extremely traditional. Well, okay, I'll throw in one name, Bob Dylan or something. I mean, when you look at the advanced design of their devices, I would say make your music more advanced and non-traditional as much as your visual designs are. And why can't we hear the Apple logo being sonified? The same counts for the, the you know, I once said in another interview, I said, why can't we hear the Nike swoosh? We see it in multitude, but we don't hear it. Is there a reason for not doing that? That would be my question to my potential big clients called Apple and Nike. Well, there you are. You know, I was fiddling away on the piano. My mother came in when I was 12. She was a ballet teacher and we lived in South America in Surna. And she had this uh, piano in her um, ballet teaching room. And I was just fiddling about. And I said, um, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just fiddling about. And she said, no, you're not. Are you aware you're playing Beethoven? No, I don't. I mean, I was into bands like Santana or something. And she said, you must have heard it because I teach uh, classical ballet with, uh, to the pupils here with, um, with, with music like uh, from Beethoven. And you're actually playing that now, for, uh, top of mind. Um, it kind of got to me because I wasn't aware at all of, of that ability or intuition or whatever you would call it. So um, this is uh, where I decided I'll become an artist and um, I regretted that later on because you know it was a struggle uh, but um, uh, I'm happy that I uh, continued with it I, I mean I wouldn't change that for any other uh, activity in the world so um, it's been with me a long time in fact I've been married uh, the longest with the muse called music ever since my 12th. Um, yeah, well, you know, how spicy do I like my food? All of a sudden, you know, I get a teleprompter uh, asking me that. Um, well, that's easy. When I was 30, I'm in my late 50s now. When I was 30, I started getting real stomach pains. And then I went over to, um, you know, to the, uh, the GP. And he said, um, stop spicy food. I, you know, my mother's Indonesian. So uh, we took a lot of spicy foods. Uh, sambal, not sure if you know that in the States. That's a very sticky, peppery kind of stuff, which you kind of put into the rice or the noodles. And I uh, had a habit of doing that every day, even, you know, like a spicy sandwich or something. However, the GP, the doctor said, uh, you got to quit all of that stuff. And I did from one day to another, never missed it again. So today and ever since 20 years on, I like my spood, my spood, my food to be extremely non-spicy. When I shop for clothing, I still have my old reflex of my early 20s, where I went to, you know, your local flea markets either in England or in, in Holland, to get your old uh, retro suit going. And at the time, I didn't mind for the crotch to be a little yellowish, you know, because it, it was dry clean, but it didn't help out the stains of the uh, previous owner. And you know what? I didn't care less at the moment. But nowadays, <laughs> I've become more, uh, what, what would I call it, detached or, well, at least a, a bit more selective and um, you know I, uh, I, I, I dislike that kind of thing now uh, so uh, it's got to be brand new and the good thing about the brand new suits is that it's not a suit suit it's not like a, a, your 80s way up here waistline suits anymore or the shoulder pads um, Duran Duran style you know new romantics no today the cut of a suit is as good if not better than the ones I used to have with the yellow stain on there. So um, um, I buy them new and um, you know budget wise 
I'm still looking for a little good deal. However, these days you can have a, 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 a run of the pack type of suit also being personally modified to you. So a bit more this, a bit more that, if you're lucky. And um, that's what I do. So that is how I get my suits. Uh, and how many suits do I wear? As you see today, not many. Um, what I think I should bring to a deserted island would be probably one book, one piece of music, or rather an instrument. I guess I would choose an instrument instead of a vinyl record or a digital mp3 or whatever. Um, so I think it would be more important for me to survive on that island and I guess to entertain myself better by having an instrument in which I can vary what I can hear unlimitedly so. You know, with a record of someone else is going to play the Hotel California every day uh, till your life ends on the island, for example. But however, when you play yourself, you can change whatever is the men musical menu of the day. So that's my number two. And my number three would probably be, um, yeah, I guess uh, my uh, Swiss Army knife. Whoa. And if I would have a million dollars in cash, you know what I would do? I would um, not buy anything. I wouldn't. What I would do is spend on traveling. So I guess you buy trips. But what I mean with buying, I wouldn't buy a car or a house or a third suit or something. What I would do is spend most of it on traveling and on recording my own music with my favorite you know, engineers, musicians, arrangers, uh, singers. And um, my favorite mobile app, oh yeah, this is a terrible dilemma because I have, my favorite one is called, um, unfortunately, <laughs> but fortunately, Spotify. Spotify is cool as a listener, consumer. As an artist, we're still waiting for the money. But it's my favorite app. It's wonderful. I don't have a favorite uh, video game at all, so I have to give you a miss on that. And the favorite word I neither have, maybe eigen, which is a Dutch word for make it into your own, eigen. And the books I'm reading these days, I, I don't read books. I, um, I have many of them around, but uh, my concentration span has become more limited when I get older now, which is really funny. But um, so what I do is I read articles, just like you don't play albums that much anymore, but rather songs. I also do uh, articles, you know, in the New Yorker or in the Mojo magazine or on Pitchfork online or in life to go retro. So articles, not full books. Um, a word of advice for aspiring artists, believe in yourself. I mean, the, the industry, as Quincy Jones said, what industry? So the music industry is your own now. You can shape it your own way. I try to do it that way as well, DIY. It's an ethic which can bring you further than, you know, even the Beatles would have become if they would have tried it in their time. Brilliant as they still are. So stick to your own guns. There is no science to music or to the music industry. It's your own and make it into your own. Stick with it. All right, so Fiona Bloom and I, um, we have a wonderful relationship in collaborating and uh, we hope to do a lot more stuff together. And um, I hope this time I gave you a little more insight on you know, how my uh, erratic mind works. Check out my stuff if you want, and um, we'll see each other next time, right? Okay, thanks for listening.